I'm gonna kind of skip over some stuff. Not really. It's mostly just him trying to get jobs on ships because he liked he liked the nomadic lifestyle. You know what I mean? Like he was used to basically drinking, finding random work, getting enough money to rent a bed somewhere and hang out with prostitutes all day. Like, you know, like you do. But, okay, I'm probably going to have to kill this guy, right? Are you going to come after me? You are. What? Oh, Jesus. Oh, good! More random dudes! Oh, please help me kill them. Oh, thank you. Thank you, kind stranger. Oh, of course not. Of course you abandoned me, you fucking nerd. <sighs> so, yeah. Basically, his sister and her husband were at their fucking wit's end. They were done with Richard. They were done with his bullshit. They're like, you're not getting in a job. You're not putting, putting any fucking effort into getting a job. Because he didn't want to. You know, he wanted, all he wanted to do was get fucked up, cause mayhem, and sleep it off to then wake up and do it all over. Okay, how do I... Siege artillery. Okay. There has to be siege artillery elsewhere, you fucking shits. Don't chop me up. That's creepy. Siege master tracks and where the fuck is this dude? But yeah, so sister basically kicks him the fuck out. She's like, I'm done, dude. I'm done with your bullshit. I'm done. With you lying to me, I'm done with you just fucking around, not contributing, and just being a drunk. So he convinced, they basically, they drove him to a place where he could try to find a job and gave him 25 bucks and left. Uh, he told his brother-in-law that he needed the money to rent a room, but what do you think he did with it? He went and he got drunk. So he was drunk, waiting around, and he gets a call and realizes that they're offering him a job. So this is July 12th, 1966. And he's super fucking pumped. He's like, he's been trying to get a job on a boat that's going to New Orleans. For some fucking reason that's in his brain, he wants to go to New Orleans. So he gets all the way there, shows up to get the job. Ah, no! And he is informed upon his arrival that the job has been taken. That the position's already been filled, and that a sailor who was way more experienced and had a higher ranking was offered the job. And die, you bitch! Thank you. Um, where the fuck am I supposed to go with this bullshit? Am I supposed to go this way? Oh, kill me. Kill me. Siege Master what? Who is the Siege? Is that Siege Master? Nope. I'm so dumb. Where the fuck am I? Mm. I don't know. Seriously. This is why I have the thing you can play that says, what am I doing? Yep. God fucking damn it, Chad. You son of a bitch. Yep. What am I doing? <laughs> oh, that made me kind of happy. <laughs> Thank you for the bits. Oh, I'm getting my butthole kicked. Nope, nope, nope. No, 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 no. Hey, hey, hey. Goodbye, cow. Uh-huh. So, yeah, he gets there, gets told the job's taken, and he's fucking pissed. Oh, he's mad. So mad. So, what do you do when you... <laughs> what do you do when you're drunk and you're mad? You go get drunk, right? But the thing is, is that Richard didn't also like to drink. He liked uppers barbiturates and they have they have a special name for them 
what were they called? They were called red birds and yellow jackets. Red pills. They were red pills and yellow pills with black stripes. So he called them red birds and yellow jackets. That was the common term for, you know, barbiturates back then. So this dude took a bunch of fucking uppers, <laughs> drank a bunch, and then hung out. And he spent all of his money, so he couldn't get a room. So he slept outside on a bench until the very next morning, July 13th, where he waited outside of the place where where he was trying to get a job. And he waited and he waited and he waited, and there were no jobs being offered. Nothing. So Richard got even more mad. And so since Richard got even more mad, what do you do? He got more drunk. Went across the street. Started drinking. Uh, until later at night where he walked out of the bar he was at. And came across a 53-year-old woman. Who he started hitting on. And she did not appreciate it. She thought it was weird. Because there's a dude that's like 25 years younger than her trying to bone her. You know, she's like, who the fuck are you? So she politely refuses. And that makes Richard really mad. So Richard pulls his knife out and says, you're coming with me. And he leads this poor woman back to his hotel room. And... (sighs) He, he starts drilling her, interrogating her, you know, like, do you have kids? Would you, would you have had sex with me if I didn't make you come here with a knife? Just like all this weird, crazy shit. She's like trying to appease him in any way that she can, as you know, most women would try to do, you know, that's, you're being attacked. You're trying to be hurt. You try to humanize yourself. That's honestly something that's really important that you should always do. Humanize yourself. And never let them take you to a second location. (laughs) Ever. You kick and scream. Someone says, you're coming with me. Or I'm going to shoot you. You say, okay, fuck it, shoot me. (laughs) Because if they take you to a second location, you're done. Unless you're like Elizabeth Smart or like Philando Castile's girls. But yeah, so he sexually assaults her. And rifles through her purse. Finds a twenty-two caliber gun. And he says... You're going to meet me at the bar for a date. And if you don't, I'm going to find you. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill your whole family. Kind of a hard, uh, hard date to pass up on. But so he lets her go, goes back out to drink, and then he gets bored. And he remembers that he saw really cute girls sunbathing in this row of condominium complexes like i don't know how to describe them but they're they were they were condos you know or they're still connected like apartments but they're not broken up you know what i mean like it's a whole house but stacked next to one another condominiums you get it and he remembered that student nurses lived there so I know this is slightly tedious and I know that this might annoy some of you, but the more I read about these girls, the more awful I felt for them. And one thing that really bothers me about serial killer podcasts, serial killer books, serial killer shows, you know, ID channel, all that shit snapped. They never, ever, ever focus on the victims they're starting to now i watched an awesome ted bundy documentary and it really focused on the woman that he had a long-term relationship with and her daughter and i i don't want to be like that so i would like to read you their names and I would like to read you just a short thing about them. And I seriously, I know this is stupid and it sounds really weird. <laughs> but.
But if this happened to me, I wouldn't want to be just known as one of those eight nurses that got killed. You know, I would want someone to know my name and what I went through. So there were eight women that he killed. Uh, Merlita Gargulo, she was 22. She was from the Philippines. She was working on her post-grad work in America. Nina Schmel, she was 24. She was a Sunday school teacher and a volunteer nurse maid until she became a nurse. Patricia Matuski, Matu- Matusik, she was 20. She was a swimming champion, and she was going to begin work at a local children's hospital. Gloria Davy was 22. She was a nurse was the president of her student nurse association in Illinois, and she was going to join the Peace Corps after graduating. Valentina Passion was 23 and was a graduate of Manila Nursing. She was in the USA also for postgraduate work. Suzanne Ferris was a student nurse engaged to be married to the last victim's brother, Mary Ann Jordan, who was 20. She was best friends of, with Susan Ferris as her brother was engaged to be married to him. The lone survivor was Corazon Amaro, and she was also a graduate of Manila Nursing School in the Philippines and was in America. There were three girls that had busted their asses in the Philippines to become nurses and did so well that they were accepted at at, at a graduate program in America. And they were going to take that information and all of everything that they learned, and they were going to bring it back to their own country and use it for good. And he took that away. And something that really bothered me too, is that all of the articles I read described all of this stuff for all these women. But you notice that the three women that were from, the Philippines literally had no bio, no information. It's, it's like they were the less dead of the women that were killed because they were brown. But <sighs> they lived in a southeast Chicago condominium that was rented out by the college of the South. It was the South Chicago Community College. The South Community South Chicago Community Hospital. Fuck. (laughs) Learn to talk. All right. Um, And those were the women that he took their lives from. And what I'm going to tell you next is his crimes, how they were committed, and the order in which it happened. And I needed this whole fucking diagram and notes that I wrote because this shit was insane. I don't know how he pulled this off. It was a series of unfortunate events. Thank you, Full Moon. I I know. I know it's, it's annoying for some people, but uh, I looked at every single one of their faces. I remember. I remember victims' names. I remember. And people think I'm this morbid weirdo, but I remember because I would want someone to remember me. You know, I go to random fucking old cemeteries and clean up the stones because no one's there to visit them anymore. That makes me sad. Like, there's not people to remember than. This stuff happened for no reason. It's it would happen for no reason to begin with. No, it didn't happen for no reason. It happened because Richard Speck was selfish. And in his purest form, he was a predator. So. After he had beaten and raped this woman and threatened her. Basically saying, you know. Oh, yeah. Drive through you bitches. Wait, can I kill you? Can I kill you? Can I do stuff? Can I kill you? No? Okay. Well, I'm just gonna fucking run then. Whee! 
Um, are they going to follow me? Oh, God. Please don't. Don't follow me. Oh, Christ. Here we go. There we go. Fucking kill this nerd. Kill up! Oh my god, I can't get off of this stupid thing! Ugh. Yes, I can. I'm just dumb. Did I- Oh, I- I'm a fucking scumbag. I stole that. I didn't steal it, but- <laughs> It counts! I did damage! God, I'm lazy. Okay. So. After he's beaten and raped this woman, threatened her life, Stolen her 22 caliber handgun. He starts wandering, wandering around southeast side of Chicago. And he sees these condominiums that he remembers seeing really cute girls sunning outside of. So he goes into the back, you know, gets a window open, reaches in. Oh. I just blew my own asshole up. All right, here we go. Hey, that's what I say. That's what I say when I eat Taco Bell. Um, gets the door open, walks inside. Now, this part for me is the scariest part. Because when you think about some dude breaking into your house, some guy breaking into your house, or, or an intruder, you think about, like, you know, you hear a noise, or he comes through the front fucking door, like... He got in the house, walks up the steps, because all of the bedrooms were upstairs. Corazon Amaral and her roommate, Valentina. Valentina was still awake. She was doing her prayers. Uh, Corazon was really annoyed by that because she wanted to go to bed. You know, it was 1030, 11 o'clock. And she hears a light on her bedroom door. In their in their home, on her bed on their bedroom door, so she thinks it's just you know another nurse or just a, one of her friends. So she stands up and answers the door, and instead of seeing someone who lives in that home, Richard Speck has a gun pointed at her, and he. Bum rushes them, shoves them into the into their room and says, where are the other girls? Are there any other girls here? Where are they? They're too scared to speak. They don't say a damn thing. One, probably because they're too terrified to talk. And two, because, you know, who the fuck wants to give up their friends uh, to an asshole with a gun in their house? You know, that's terrifying. Will you end? Don't end me. So he says, where are the other girls? They got to be over here. So he takes them, leads them to the front bedroom where he turns the lights on, where he sees three other girls sleeping in their dormitory bunks. And the girls groggily wake up, you know, they're like, what the hell is going on? It's 11 o'clock at night. I'm trying to sleep. Who the fuck is turning lights on? And they see two of their roommates being held at gunpoint. And he makes all of them get up. And he makes them all lie face down on the ground. And he takes out a large hunting knife and he starts cutting strips from the sheets. Just like what he did with his last one. Whoa! Um, just like what he did with his previous assaults on other women. He would rip up bed sheets. And he tied them all up. So, he starts saying, you know, how much money you got? blah 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 Give me this. I'm not going to hurt you. All I need is your money. Because I'm trying to get to New Orleans. So he's rifling through their shit and then he hears the door open and close and he hears footsteps. 
So he hides. And the first interruption at 11.30, Gloria Davy returns from a date with her fiancé. She walks up the steps to go to her bedroom. She opens the door to find all of her roommates in their underwear, tied up and gagged with bedsheets, lying face down on the floor. Can you fucking imagine? Can you imagine that? Imagine coming home from a date. Not a fucking clue in the world what's going on. 30 minutes after this man broke into the house and she interrupts him and you walk into your room and all of your friends are tied face down and there's a man with a gun in your face. He ties her up, forces her to lay down, and then he grabs one of the women, one of the girls, and brings her into the back bedroom where he strips her because he's going to sexually assault her. Then he hears the door close again. More voices, more steps coming up the stairs, little footsteps coming up the stairs. He's interrupted by Suzanne Ferris and Marianne Jordan. And Suzanne Ferris was engaged to be married to Marianne's older brother that summer. And they went upstairs. And they were met by Richard with a knife and a gun. And one by one, he takes these girls and drags them out one by one. And you hear a muffled scream. And then about 20 minutes later, he comes in for another one. Drags them out, kicking and screaming in muffled scream. And one by one, over the course of three hours, that just made me shit my pants. What the fuck? What? Okay. I, I was in my, I was in my flow. I, oh my God. What in the fuck just happened? That wasn't me. I didn't do it. For once, it wasn't me. Oh, my God. Jesus Christ, that scared the shit out of me. Yeah, pretty much. Surprise, motherfucker. That's what just fucking happened. God, fuck your mother, damn it. That scared the shit out of me. So did the surprise, motherfucker. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, way to ruin all my... 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 <laughs> you ruined the mood. Okay, well, you know what? I'm going to get back into serious mode because this is fucking serious. But yeah. So basically, these girls are tied up at the mercy of this fucking man who's obviously heavily intoxicated, very angry, has a very large hunting knife, a smaller knife, and a gun. And they, Amaral later said that they were debating whether or not to fight against him or to just go with what he said and they said it was probably better not better to not get him upset but yeah so after the third woman was taken after richard because literally he had all these girls in one room and imagine you're sitting there in a room filled with your friends and a man comes in opens the door points and says you grabs one of your friends, drags them out, and then you never see them again. And then he comes back in and does it again and again and again. Now, after the third or fourth murder, Corazon, the fucking thinker that she is, she rolls underneath the bed, one of the beds in the master bathroom, in, in the fucking terror and confusion of the situation. She waited till nobody was paying attention. And she rolled her ass underneath the bed. And then for the next three hours. She had to listen to all eight of her roommates be murdered. 
one by one over three hours. And she said that she never heard screams. She never heard anything. She said that she heard it hurts being shouted in uh, Filipino. But that was it. So this girl is under that bed until the last one is dragged out and murdered. But Richard is so fucked up. He doesn't remember how many there were. She was the first one he saw. But she was the one he forgot. So for another hour, she laid under that bed, muffling her cries, while she listened to Richard walk around their home freely, dig through their stuff, go through their purses, steal every penny that he could, until he finally left. Now, he left around 4 a.m., and when it was about 5 a.m., that's when everyone's alarms started going off. But she still didn't get out from under the bed. So, for a whole other hour, she listened to all... Can you imagine hiding under a bed? Just put yourself there. You're hiding under a bed. You've literally never been more scared in your life. And you've been listening to nothing but the dead silence of your roommate's bodies. And then it's just multiple alarm clocks going off. To me, that reminds me almost of... Did you ever see... I know this sounds horrible, but the Mandalay Bay terrorist attack. The aftermath where you could just hear dozens of cell phones ringing just going unanswered and you knew that some of those cell phones were on people who were dead and the only thing you can think about is oh my god who is calling that person in absolute terror scared to death that that their loved one's dead and they are and they're just it's just ringing and ringing and ringing i feel like that's how she felt listening to multiple alarms for each of her friends alarms that she's probably heard go off a million times and she knows whose alarms what you know and she stayed under that bed for hours until she was finally convinced that he was no longer in the house and when she rolled out from under the bed she had to run through the doorway of the first bedroom, which had two of her friends stabbed, laying in the doorway. She had to crawl over them. She finally ran to her front bedroom. She knocked out the window, climbed out onto the edge. What do I need to do with Deathwing? Oh, God. Well, she climbed out on the ledge. And in both English and can't and and in Philippine, I I I feel so bad. I don't remember the name of what the language is. Please, I'm not meaning to be insensitive or offensive. I re I'm really not. Um. She just started screaming. They're all dead. They're all dead. All my friends are dead. All my friends are dead. Everyone's dead. God help me. And a man walking his dog, heard her. Ran out. And then another neighbor saw her, and she's just screaming hysterically. Well, they call the police, and there was a police officer local that happened to be driving around, and they flagged him down. And he entered the house through the back. The back door was open. And the first thing that he sees is uh, Gloria Davy. She is naked, tied with her arms behind her back, and a straight a sheet around her neck. She's naked, strangled, face down. And the officer looks at her face 
and realizes that she is the little sister of a longtime girlfriend that he dated, now ex. So he found his ex's little sister dead, naked. Goes upstairs, finds the rest of the bodies. Some of the women have been just been strangled. Some of them have been stabbed and strangled. Some of them just stabbed. <sighs> so, Corazon is obviously taken to the hospital. She's in fucking shock. Can't, can you, I can't even imagine. Can't even imagine what that must have been like. She is a stronger woman than me. I'll tell you what. But she describes him, the man, as being heavily popmarked because he had very bad acne as a kid, having sandy blonde hair that was combed back with a soft southern draw. And so they thought, all right, this dude's got a southern draw. He's got to be from fucking somewhere else. So they're going around the bars. They're going around just questioning anyone that they can. And the people at the bar say, oh, yeah, we were talking with a guy who's from the south. He, he's been trying to get a trying to get a job on a boat because he wants to go to New Orleans. Ding, ding, ding. Number one. So they say, OK, so they go down to the maritime office. They go down there. And they're like, hey, was there a man from the South who was looking to get a boat to New Orleans? And they're like, yeah, here, it's this guy who's been doing it. And they bring up Richard Speck's picture. So Richard, of course, the night that he did all this, once he was done, he went home back to his little flop house and got you went to sleep you know i think he knew what he did i know he knew what he did but i digress wakes up the next morning goes downstairs to get a beer because you know why not start drinking again in the morning and he gets the newspaper that says eight nurses slain but one was left alive and can identify the killer. So the cops try to set traps for him. They try to have like the office reach out, reach out to him and say, oh, hey, you know, there's a job offering in New Orleans for a boat going to New Orleans. Richard's a little smarter than that. Doesn't show up, doesn't fall for the trap. You know, but once he realizes, oh, shit. They know who I am because they published his name because he had left lots of fingerprints in that house. He was not careful in the slightest. And they put out his picture and he pretty much found out, oh, I'm fucked. So what do you do when you're a murderer, but you're also a giant fucking coward and you know you're going to get caught? You try to kill yourself <laughs> sorry so Richard goes gets a bunch of booze gets fucked up smashes the bottle cuts his wrists now so many articles said that he was found covered in blood by this or that person, blah de blah, blah No, this idiot cut his wrists and then started yelling, I'm gonna die, help. <laughs> like, basically just being like, oh, shouldn't have done that. So, the neighbor, basically the, the people who were, saw him walk around covered in blood yelling for help, you know, obviously called the cops. And the cops, you know, they don't really even take a second look at Richard because it's skid row. He's surrounded by prostitutes. It's a port area. 
people are fucking coming in and out all the time, all sorts of troublemakers, you know, it's just, it's just another asshole that tried to kill himself. They don't even look at him. Now, the first fact in this case that gave me goosebumps was him not banging on the front door and being let in. It was him banging on a bed, knocking lightly on a bedroom door. Like, you can't even trust opening your own bedroom door. That is the first thing that scared the shit out of me about this case. Yeah. Unless he cut his wrist long ways, yeah. He, he, he sliced his wrists and he sliced the inside of his fucking elbows and shit, too. He tried. He tried. 